Uh, welcome uh, to uh, University Temple United Methodist Church and their Common Good Cafe. And we thank them very much for hosting this event. This is not a regular Common Good uh, Cafe event, so it has a little bit of a different format than their Thursday night uh, events. Uh, my name's Jerry Condon. I'm a proud member of Veterans for Peace, and I serve on the National Board of Veterans for Peace. And uh, we've been uh, very strongly in Chelsea Manning's corner since uh, right when she was arrested. Uh, we, we were part of forming the, uh, at that time, Bradley Manning Support Network. And uh, at our first, uh, well, at our August 2010 convention, we awarded uh, Chelsea Manning the uh, Our Courage of Conscience Award. Uh, many uh, veterans for peace members have been arrested, uh, even protesting uh, the torturous conditions that uh, Chelsea Manning was being held in at uh, Quantico Marine Brig, you'll recall. and. Uh, uh, so we, we remain very much involved. I've had the honor the last three and a half years to represent Veterans for Peace on the steering committee of the Private Manning Support Network. And uh, here in Seattle, there's been a lot of support for Chel Chelsea Manning. In fact, uh, uh, Pete Schoonmaker here and members of the War Resistors Support Action Team of Veterans for Peace have been maintaining a weekly vigil at Westlake every Saturday afternoon uh, in support of Chelsea Manning for many, many months. I think it's probably been a couple of years now. So, and that's ongoing. So uh, Veterans for Peace is very solidly in the corner and uh, Chelsea Manning. We also want to uh, uh, thank uh, all the local organizations who have co-sponsored uh, this event this evening. So anyway, uh, I'll stop talking and get our main speaker up here. He's gonna talk, David Coombs is gonna talk for about 30 minutes or so. He has a lot to share. And then we're going to open it up and have a Q&A for until 9, when I understand we have to, to be out of here at 9. Uh, so uh, please uh, welcome David Coombs. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, for coming out here on, on this evening. Um, I'm very honored to be here. I'm originally from Idaho, so the Pacific Northwest is a home for me, and so I'm very happy to have this be my last stop. I will tell you that on each of the occasions that I've spoken, the part that I actually enjoyed the most has been the Q&A session afterwards. And so when we get to that point, uh, hopefully we'll have at least 45 minutes or so for that. But if you have a question, I'll answer your question, okay? so. Uh, think now what you might want to ask. Um, I might not have a great answer for it, but I'll, I'll give you an answer. Um, you know, I, I can tell you that it has been now almost three months since the sentencing hearing, and I had hoped that in that time period I, I could kind of reconcile with the 35-year sentence. I'd hoped that, like most things, time would have the tendency to heal all wounds, but it has not. And it hasn't because uh, I believed, and I still believe, that what Chelsea did in essentially January of 2010 was an incredibly brave act. Uh, she did something that was really amazing for a person of her age and of her experience at that time. But kind of the really truly amazing aspect of what she did is the fact that so many didn't do what she did. When you think about the information that she released, she released this information from a network called the CIPRNet. It's the secret internet protocol network that much of the Department of Defense and uh, for that matter, much of the government works off of. There are over a million people who had access to the CIPRNet to the information that Chelsea ultimately decided to share. And yet, no one before her spoke out. And why is that? When you think about that, the, the answer that comes back to me um, when I ask that question 
is it takes a lot of courage to do something that you know your government does not want you to do. And that is speak out when it's the right thing to do. And the government wishes you to be silent. And that was the decision that Chelsea found herself in. She initially deployed to Iraq not with the mindset that I'm going to release information. That wasn't uh, what she was planning on doing. She deployed, like so many other soldiers, with the idea that I'm going to go there to enforce the rule of law. I'm going to go there to help build a country that's representative and that is responsive to its citizens. I'm going to go there to make life a little better for the Iraqis who've had it so bad for so long. Unfortunately, within a short period of time, she started to see things that were troubling her. And those things started to pile up to the point that she couldn't close her eyes to what she was seeing. And as she wrote later, it was something that she couldn't keep inside of her head, something that she did not believe belonged on some server um, in you know, some government building, never to see the light of the day. And so at that point, she decided to do something about it. And when she released the information that she did, it did a lot of good, an incredible amount of good. Just to talk about a couple of things, uh, the first thing is it really did in the Iraq war. And a lot of people would say, well, you know, isn't that a little bit um, a bold statement? But it's the truth. It ended the Iraq war. And it ended the Iraq war because once it became known how many innocent civilians were being killed, once we had an, act uh, an accurate body count of the true cost of this war, then even the Iraqi government couldn't close its eyes to how it was impacting its citizens. And at that point said, we need to have criminal jurisdiction over American soldiers. That obviously was not something that the United States would permit under the Status of Forces Agreement. That precipitated the end of the Iraq War. So had you not had the SIGAX, that never would have happened. So that is an amazing aspect to that, one person ending a war. Then secondly, as that's related to that, is knowing the true cost of war. Oftentimes we look at the monetary cost only, or just the cost of loss of American soldiers, as if that, those lives are worth more than any other life. And that's not the case. Life is precious. No matter if you're an American, or an Iraqi, or an Afghanistan, or any other third world country, or for that matter, coalition force. Life is precious. So it gave us a true glimpse into the cost of war when it comes to the human factor. But then not only that, she disclosed documents that shed the light on a place called Guantanamo, a place that our president promised he would close, and it's still open. A place that we spend somewhere in the neighborhood between a million to upwards of two million a year per detainee. And we do that, and we've been told we do, we're doing that because these are the most dangerous people you can imagine. These are people that at one point, it was rumored that these, if, if you didn't have them chained and pretty much hogtied for the most part, they would actually chew through power cords for the planes that were flying them to Guantanamo just to bring the planes down. That was the rumor about how just terrible these people were. Well, there's a, a person who knows a thing or two about them, um, and the former chief prosecutor for Guantanamo, and who actually, once he started to look at the information that Chelsea shared, realize that the truth of the matter is we have a lot of people there that really don't belong in Guantanamo. 
uh, if they are, in fact, uh, related in any way, shape, or form to who we would say is the enemy, they're low-level operatives at best. These are not the worst of the worst. So the information that she shared with us um, educated us on the people that are being held in Guantanamo, and hopefully, even though we still have not been able to close Guantanamo, hopefully Guantanamo will be closed. Then she also educated us on how we deal with other countries. We saw through the diplomatic cables that were released how not that our country doesn't always do what we would hope it would do. And, and that's a little disheartening. Because um, you would think that as the self-appointed um, free leader of the world, that we would, in fact, always do what is the right thing. Not just the right thing for us, but what's the right thing? To make this world a little bit better of a place. Well, Chelsea shed some light on that as well. And she did this because she is somebody who identifies as a humanist. And as a humanist, she couldn't close her eyes. And she decided at that point, I'm going to make what I know public. And she hoped that when she did that, it would spark worldwide debates, it would spark worldwide reforms. That was her goal, that was her hope. Our country has chosen to ignore, for the most part, all the benefits that I've talked about, and those were just a few of the benefits. Instead of acknowledging those benefits, and yet another one would have been Arab Spring, bringing freedom to much of a section of the world that for the longest time, had no hope of that. Tunisia, Egypt, Bahrain, Syria. But our country says, no, Chelsea's release cannot be credited as being something that sparked that. And the main reason that that position is taken is because of the embarrassment factor. The embarrassment factor that this information was released. It wasn't an authorized release by our country, it was something that they didn't want to be released. And because it embarrassed the administration, then you heard how this was such a terrible thing, how the sky essentially was falling. It was a meltdown of American diplomacy. It was something that would lead to the loss of soldiers' lives. People who disclosed this information had blood on their hands. This is the type of information that was put out. Three years later, is there any truth to any of that? No. Not only there's no truth to that, but then our country decided, well, if they're not necessarily believing how terrible this might be, let's kill the messenger. Let's try to portray the messenger in a negative light. So then all of a sudden, Chelsea became a disgruntled soldier. Chelsea became somebody who was mentally ill, somebody who was not fit for service. Chelsea did, in fact, suffer during the deployment. It wasn't mental illness, it was suffering from a conscience. That's what she was suffering during the deployment. And she had to act. So, where do we go from here? One of the kind of harsh truths of a whistleblower and someone like Chelsea is that time has a way of forgetting you and forgetting the sacrifice that you have made and the message that you put out. And that's because what happens oftentimes is our country gets uh, distracted a little bit by other things that happen. The media no longer pays attention People don't uh, inform themselves. And everything that we've learned, the information that was shared with us, is forgotten. And that's what the, those who didn't want this to come out in the first place is hoping happens. 
And unfortunately, that's what happens to the majority of the whistleblowers. And in Chelsea's instance, um, that's, that's what uh, I think the country is hoping, the government is hoping will happen. People will forget about her. They'll forget about the message that she put out. But it's too important that we allow that to happen. It's too important that we sit by idly and allow the message to be forgotten. And one organization in particular, Courage to Resist, uh, and Jeff Patterson, is doing what they can to ensure that the message is not forgotten. And I know several organizations have stepped forward to support Chelsea. And first I wanna just talk about Courage to Resist for a moment. Uh, when Courage to Resist came and contacted me, it was right from the beginning. So we're talking essentially in the September of 2010 timeframe, which was a very dangerous time to step up and say, I want to support Chelsea Manning. Because if you think back to the, that time, what was going on? The government was talking about the fact that we should do a targeted assassination of Julian Assange. The government was pressuring, um, and many of our congressmen and women were pressuring companies to defund WikiLeaks. You had Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, all saying, yes, we're, we will not uh, process any donations to WikiLeaks. So the fact that you as an organization, Courage to Resist, step forward and says, I want to help, and in fact, I will guarantee the legal defense expenses for Chelsea Manning, was at great risk to them. Because the ire that was directed towards WikiLeaks could have easily been directed towards Courage to Resist. Jeff has said on more than one occasion he was expecting his nonprofit uh, designation to be revoked at some time or be audited frequently. Uh, that hasn't happened, which is good. But the fact that they did step forward was a very brave act. And they were there from the very beginning, and they're there today. And they promised to be there until Chelsea is free. And for that, I am internally uh, indebted to Courage to Resist and its members. The other organization I want to talk about for a moment is the Veterans for Peace. Now, that organization I knew a little less about, um, but I will tell you that the organization has also been there right from the beginning, supporting. And my first real true understanding of what Veterans for Peace does happened not that long ago when I was in uh, Santa Monica. I went for a, a run, I uh, flew out to Santa Monica on Saturday, I was gonna speak on Sunday. Uh, Sunday morning I wake up trying to adjust myself to the time difference, which I still haven't, by the way. Uh, but I went for a run, and for me, from the East Coast, running on the beach in December is a luxury. Uh, so I immediately headed towards the beach, and I started running, and at that time, it was around seven in the morning, there, there really wasn't anyone else out other than other runners. And I saw some movement off to my right. And that movement was of three men who were putting red and white crosses in the sand. And I, I didn't know what that was. I had no clue for sure what it was. But I will tell you, as a soldier, I had a visceral response to that. Because I saw crosses in the sand, and I thought how profound that message is to see crosses in the sand. And I had to stop. And I walked up to one of the gentlemen and I asked him, what are you doing? And that's when he explained to me the significance of uh, what is the considered, I guess, by them, the Arlington West Memorial that they put up every Sunday and have been putting up every Sunday for 10 years. How amazing is that? And if you go on their website, I, I took several photographs of it, but if you go on their website and you look at it, it looks like Arlington by the time they're done. 
It is with military precision, the distance between crosses, the rows. They ran out of beachfront, and they had to use red crosses for every 10 soldiers killed, and white crosses for every soldier, and they used the white crosses for the more recent ones. But I looked at that, and when they told me that, uh, I was moved by that message. So much so that I actually had to go back uh, at around the lunchtime to see it completed. And that's when I realized as well just how important Chelsea is, that we don't forget her. Because the cost of forgetting is much too high. 7,678 souls for American service members. That's the cost in Afghanistan and Iraq. 7,678 sons and daughters, husbands and wives, mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers. What these 7,678 people could have accomplished in this world, had they not committed the ultimate sacrifice for the country, we'll never know. We'll never know the loss, really, to our country from not having these people present. But when you think about that cost, you realize that we have to be informed as an American public. And too often, we have to be informed by whistleblowers because the media is not performing their function as watchdogs. They simply print what the government tells them. Our government, for right or wrong reasons, since 2001, has become very secretive. We have a huge problem with overclassification in our country. By some estimates, we have over a billion pieces of information classified and counting. In 2012, the organization that keeps track and reports for the government said there were 97 million classification determinations made during that year. This is all information that we don't know. And in many cases, we should know. And that is why we need whistleblowers. That is why we need people like Chelsea, who are willing to step forward at great risk to themselves and educate us on what we should already know. So now the question becomes, are we going to let Chelsea be forgotten? She was hoping for world worldwide debates. She was hoping for public reforms. Those worldwide debates can happen in Seattle. That can be where it starts. It can go to Vancouver, which, by the way, I'll tell you, having somebody from Canada up here was, was good. My wife is Canadian. So, little known fact, uh, Canada has been a strong supporter of Chelsea from the very beginning. Uh, my wife has committed a lot uh, of her personal energy to this case as well. So, I'm hoping that through even today, and what we talk about with the Q&A going forward, we can start that debate. And we can start to realize that it is so important that when we have our next um, conflict in this world, and some have said that war is a necessary evil, and for just tonight's purposes, let's accept that to be true, if that is true, then that necessary evil must be done with full information, a complete understanding of why we're doing it, and that there are no other re recourses available. Because when it's not, we sacrifice much too much. So I'm hoping that uh, here today, we'll rise to that occasion, and we will, in fact, do what Chelsea had hoped and that is start worldwide debates and worldwide reforms. Thank you. Uh, David, uh, for starters, could you maybe tell us
us a little bit about the ongoing efforts to free Chelsea and also to support her as long as she's in prison. Yes. So what we are doing now, the, there are several stages for the possibility of getting a better outcome for Chelsea than the 35 years. The first is going to be the review by the convening authority, which should happen sometime in January, February timeframe. That's when I can submit uh, clemency matters on behalf of Chelsea. The convening authority has the power to do anything uh, to include disapproving the findings and sentence. Uh, cannot increase the punishment, but can do anything short of that. Uh, in my experience, it's rare that a convening authority would do that, but it's not impossible. Uh, Amnesty International is collecting uh, signatures in order to uh, be submitted uh, with my clemency matters. Uh, they've written to the community authority asking him to reduce the sentence to time served. So that is the first step. Then we have the presidential pardon and the Secretary of Army commutation request. They're both kind of related. Uh, both of those uh, actions have, of course, the power to reduce the sentence and or immediately release Chelsea. Uh, I don't hold much hope for either, uh, but uh, you have to make them tell you no. And it's unfortunate that uh, we don't have more of a push to make it an uncomfortable no, but that's the situation we're at with that. The most realistic hope is on 2 February 2020. That is the time in which Chelsea comes up for parole. And she will be an excellent, excellent candidate for parole. When you think about uh, what parole is, the, the first thing they, they look at are, is, you know, your, are your risk for recidivism? <laughs> if they give Chelsea access to classified information, maybe. But I don't think she's going to be a risk for recidivism. Are, are you violent? Well, she's not violent. She's a humanist. So we're okay on that. Uh, how have you done while in confinement? Chelsea has been a model detainee. If anyone would have acted out and been a disruptive detainee, it would have been Chelsea while at Quantico, and she was a model detainee. So I have no doubt she will continue to be a model detainee. And then they look to see, do you have any support in the community? Do you have a, a base that will help ensure that you can get on your feet and go forward in life? And Chelsea certainly has that. So when it comes to 2 February 2020, there is absolutely no reason that she should not be paroled other than having a vindictive uh, process that just simply does not want to release her. So as we get closer in time to that, obviously it'll be very important to remind people of what's at stake and the fact that she should be free. And I, for one, will be there. So then uh, I think your other question, I'm sorry. Yeah, so one of the things that we're, we're doing now is we're trying to set up to where Chelsea can uh, go to college while incarcerated. So there are universities that allow um, incarcerated individuals to take classes that actually go towards a degree. The main thing from the facility standpoint is that has to be at the detainees expense. So we're trying to ensure funds for that. And, and so that, that's one of our, our pushes there. We're also trying to ensure that her family, much of which is overseas, has the resources to come see her. Um, they're not a family with a lot of means, so we're trying to ensure that that can happen. Chelsea has the ability um, to have a, a detainee account where she can purchase comfort items that otherwise would not be provided to her, to, to include a calling card, um, which uh, I made sure she has uh, enough of a funds there to be able to call family, friends. She calls me probably three times a week. Uh, so uh, we talk on a very frequent basis. It's essentially just like any other calling card. The only difference is when she calls it says, a recording comes and says it's a call from a detainee at the USDB. I accept the call, but then I'm not charged for the call because she's paying for it. 
So what we're trying to do is ensure that she always has the funds for that. And one thing uh, I can let you on a little secret, and I guess if this is put on the internet, um, maybe other people might know it too, but I do want to say something uh, about Code Pink. Uh, Code Pink recently stepped forward um, and gave Chelsea $4,000 in her personal account. Just an amazing, very generous um, donation to her. Uh, that will ensure, undoubtedly, for at least a few years, she has the funds to call anyone she wants and uh, obviously have the ability to purchase those comfort items. So um, I sent a, a letter back to, uh, or email back to Code Pink today once I found out of the donation. Uh, but that's an example of, of basically ensuring that Chelsea has that. Then there are legal aspects that we are trying to ensure happen, and that's what some of the funding will go to as well. The main thing is hormone therapy. Uh, Chelsea has requested that. The facility has not yet made a determination. We are trying to exhaust all of the administrative um, options. Once we do that, we can take litigation steps in order to enforce Chelsea's right to adequate medical care. And thankfully, the ACLU and the Southern Poverty Law Center, SPLC, have both uh, been working closely with me to basically prepare for the day that we have to enforce Chelsea's rights. Uh, so that's another step that we're taking. So, yeah. I, I would be interested in your perspective as a lawyer on the arguments that ultimately prevail and what you see as their potential weaknesses. I think on appeal, there are a lot of very good appellate issues. Um, this case really was influenced a lot by the initial response by our government. When you have uh, people coming out with types of comments like this is a terrorist act against the United States, that this is going to aid the enemy, uh, you had many representatives who should know much, and they know better than to say comments about an ongoing case, would say that Chelsea deserved the death penalty. Uh, the President of the United States said Chelsea broke the law. So what you had then is you had the government at the various highest levels essentially already making a determination. And what that did was empower everybody else in the process. And it couldn't help, I wouldn't think, but influence everyone's perspective of the case. The arguments that I had to try to work against was the idea that this stuff should be classified, that this stuff really could not cause damage to the United States, and that we had to put it in perspective that this is not a, a type of an offense where some multiple decades would be appropriate. And to put 35 years into perspective, I've had clients, and I, you know, my, my practice is a criminal defense practice representing just Army soldiers. And you know, I, I represent uh, any soldier that needs legal services. But I've had clients that have done very bad crimes in their time, uh, whether it be murder, rape. And none of my clients have gotten 35 years. They've gotten less than that. So to, to try to say what Chelsea did is a 35-year sentence is just, it's difficult for me to, to wrap my mind around. But again, I think what ultimately prevailed was this idea that this stuff is classified and you, you being the American public, shouldn't have access to it. And there were even closed sessions during the trial where the idea was this is stuff that is too damaging for you to hear. I can tell you without disclosing classified information uh, that there was nothing in the closed sessions that caused me to lose sleep at night. And there was nothing in the closed sessions that you couldn't know today and it wouldn't do any harm to the United States. So at the end of the day, this was a 35-year sentence for embarrassment, is what it was. Okay, and so what I'm going to do, by the way, if you have to go for some reason, don't feel bad at all. Get up. If you want to wave as you go out, that's fine. You're, you're free to go. Thank you for coming. 
and I will stay here until they actually kick us out. So questions, I'll, I'll, I'll be answering all your questions, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go from one side to one side, and I'll work first part in the beginning, then I'll do middle, then end, then I'll work beginning, middle, end again. So I did here, so up here, anyone in the very first few rows? Well, I'm questioning the word pardon. If you get a pardon, does that mean that you have committed a crime and you're being pardoned for it, or is it just a matter of forgiveness? I don't think Chelsea Manning committed a crime. Right. He did a patriotic duty. Yeah, well, if, it, if you do receive a pardon, it's as if, I mean, technically you, you're, you're only getting a pardon if you're found guilty of something, but if you could get, a, I guess, a predetermination of guilt pardon. Um, but the pardon is as if it didn't happen. That would be the outcome. Uh, and then you're right, from a philosophical standpoint, if you don't believe what Chelsea did was a crime, then she shouldn't need a pardon. Okay, middle here, sir. Thank you, Professor. I'm a member of Veterans for Peace, but my background in my working career, I was regulated. Because I want to talk about the whistleblower. We have to realize that if we are going to have an efficient, good government and whatever, we have to rely on whistleblowers. If someone is making the Xerox copy, the clerk or the whatever, the low level functionary says, this is wrong, and whether it's Chelsea Manning or Joe Smith or, or Clara Blow or whatever, that's what we have to rely on in our democracy. Regulation is a nice idea, but it's not possible, it's not perfection. Thank you. Okay. My question is about that, and that is how, how do you get money to do what you're doing to defend yeah, and that's been the great thing about um, Courage to Resist and Jeff Patterson. Uh, when I say this is how much I need for something, uh, they give me that amount. So it's actually been a, I'll tell you initially when, they, when Jeff said, hey, we're going to cover your legal defense expenses and we're going to ensure that everything that needs to be done is done, I was a little bit skeptical of that. Uh, but Courage to Resist over three years has done exactly what they said they would do. So I've, I, I have nothing but uh, admiration for that organization. I don't know if it was part of your argument, uh, but if it could be argued that the war itself was illegal according to international law and also a violation of, of U.S. law because well, the reason given for it was not the true reason, it's not clear. Can it be argued then that Chelsea was not violating uh, his orders because the soldier says that uh, is told that he must obey all legal orders? Mm -hmm. Is a order to carry out part of an illegal war illegal? Yeah. So that that's kind of goes back to like the Nuremberg idea. You had many soldiers who were executed when they said, "Hey, I'm, I'm just following orders." And that didn't work out too well for them. Uh, unfortunately, in this case, the government was very successful in their pretrial motions to limit what I could and could not, could not argue, and the judge would allow or would not allow in the trial. That aspect of the argument didn't come out, but one thing that you might be surprised by, um, which you would think, well, why wouldn't that be relevant, was the fact that Chelsea believed her act to be a whistleblower, and she had good intentions, and her intentions were to inform the American public, not to aid the enemy. And so we wanted to bring that out in the merits portion, uh, but because under the Espionage Act, your intent is not relevant, that was not allowed. So really, we're, from the very beginning, working with at least one, if not both arms, tied behind our back. Go ahead. Speaking of, can you speak more about the Espionage Act and specifically uh, what were, how was it, and what was the judge's response to that, and what uh, did that um, mean for the future of journalism? Okay, so that's, there's a lot there. <laughs> I will tell you, um, the Espionage Act, it, it just, I think the most interesting angle, angle to this is how it impacts journalism, and that also is related to the aid in the enemy, but 
the idea of certain information, whether or not that could cause damage, is very amorphous, that whether you believe it could or could not cause damage. That's all is required, that you're providing information that could cause damage and that aids the enemy in some way. So for the aiding the enemy offense, which was really the government's main offense, they, that was all that they needed to prove. And the media never really keyed in on this, but the extension of, of that argument was it didn't matter who you were. If you had this information, you made it public, and it aided the enemy, or it could cause damage, whether that be the aiding the enemy offense or the Espionage Act. And really, if you carry that to its logical extreme, then the freedom of the press and the First Amendment, stuff that we really hold true and dear to our hearts, uh, would no longer really have much meaning. Because again, if you said something that could cause damage or could be used by the enemy, that's a, a very broad uh, perspective then the government could charge you. So then that really comes down to, are you one of those people that the government wants to charge? And it shows you the other aspect that's problematic is selective prosecution. Our, our government sees sometimes good leaks, and you know Bob Woodward has made his living on good leaks, and never is there a question of Bob Woodward being court-martialed or taken into a federal, um, criminal trial, and that's because he receives his leaks in such a way that it makes the government look good. In the back over here. Yes, go ahead. Well, what's going to be important is I think that everyone learned the lesson from Iraq. There were no weapons of mass destruction. And that was the sole reason we were supposedly going into Iraq. So it, as long as you don't forget that history, then we won't repeat it. And Syria is an example of a, a public that wasn't ready to forget the lesson learned in Iraq. But if we forget that lesson, then sadly there's a good chance that we would repeat the problems. So now up the front here. So the question is, how is her level of acceptance by other prisoners? Is she treated humanely by her guards and neighbors? And has there been any progress with moving her to a female institution? All great questions. So first of all, this is one of the reasons why I love my, my job. Um, I have the pleasure of representing soldiers I only represent Army soldiers. I don't represent any other service, not that I have anything against the Navy, the Air Force, Marines, the Coast Guard. But every branch is a little bit different. Even though we're under the same code of military justice, there are nuances, and I know the Army. So that's what I wanted to do, and that's the type of client I wanted to represent. I have a very big luxury as a criminal defense attorney. Um, I represent first-time offenders. That's the only people I represent. So every one of my clients, when you think about that, got to maybe at least age 18, for the most part, without committing a major crime. And then at some point in their military career, they, they did something, or allegedly did something, and then I'm their attorney. Uh, so it's a, it's a great luxury to represent those types of soldiers. Well, if they are found guilty, they go to a military prison. And the great thing about that then is they're not hardened criminals. They're not 
the type of criminal who is, you know, the second they're out, they're doing something to get back in. So every one of those individuals in the USDB is just like Chelsea. They want to do their time and then move on with their life. So even though uh, Chelsea's offense may be something where you would think, well, you know, she's going to be targeted, she's told me just the opposite. People know what she was found guilty of. They know about the fact that she's transgender. They have no issue with that. Uh, some people have said some rude comments initially. Chelsea just ignored those. Those people stopped talking about that. Um, one person in particular uh, was kind of giving her a hard time ribbing her until they needed some help writing something, and then Chelsea was very good at that, and <laughs> now all of a sudden the person likes Chelsea. Um, so, so she is treated fairly and humanely by the guards and by the other detainees. And as far as moving to a female prison, that could happen if she wanted to do reassignment surgery, which she does not at this point. So uh, the facility that you go to is judged, uh, I mean, they essentially do an anatomy check, and that's, that's what controls where you go. So unless Chelsea did reassignment surgery, she would stay at the USDB. So great questions. Yeah, so wh why, did, uh, why did Chelsea come out as Chelsea Manning the day after the, uh, the trial. Some people actually criticized that, and she was sentenced day, you know, on this day, the very next day, I'm on the Today Show announcing that she wants to be known as Chelsea. And the criticism was, you know, she's just trying to grand stage, trying to get more attention. The reality of the situation was this. She wanted to keep that a secret, actually. Um, and then about three days before her actual sentencing, Courthouse News did a story where they contacted the USDB and they said, look, there's some evidence that she has gender dysphoria, she may be transgender. Um, does she have the ability to get hormone therapy while in confinement? And they said definitively no. And so when they made that announcement, then that's when Chelsea said, and so this is, maybe two days before her sentencing, she said, I, I, I want hormone therapy. And I told her, don't worry, we're going to make it an issue. And that was the best timing for it. And uh, right now, the facility, as I said, is considering granting that request. I have faith that they'll do that. And if they don't, then uh, they'll be made to do that. So, okay, middle here. Yeah. Even within the lesbian gay community, has always been recognized or supported. Uh, but I, uh, my question to you is really how um, how have your ideas about uh, whistleblowing changed over the course of this trial, and especially in relationship to the military? It seems like, and has it, and it has it affected other people in the military? The, the trial itself and the exposure of information, and seeing how that's affected foreign policy. Yeah, you know the the great thing about. Um, people in the military is they, they're just us. I mean, I'm, I'm a lieutenant colonel in the United States Army and the reserves, and I have my, the beliefs I have. Uh, there is a, this idea that it, because the military is so structured in many ways that it also has the same kind of mindset. I had so many people tell me that they wish that information would have come out before or Iraq and Afghanistan campaigns. Uh, I had other, so many other people believe that uh, you know, the stuff that was released, now that didn't put any soldiers in harm's way. Uh, and then you had people on the opposite ends. Uh, for me, I've always thought that information is important. Transparency is important. I think that is what ultimately, at least this is my perspective, what a person in a uniform ensures that we have an open government, a transparent government. That's what we fought for when we first started this country, and that's what we fought every time we've had to fight for something. It's always been to ensure our way of life. And so it's particularly disheartening when, uh, when you're in a situation where you have to count on whistleblowers. I wish we didn't. 
Um, but my perspective is that we need them, and they're, they play a very, uh, very important role. Um, Snowden, uh, people have their opinions on Snowden probably, but uh, Snowden actually is unique in that uh, what Chelsea released, she released information about things that were happening in Afghanistan or happening in Iraq, people being killed there, not affecting us. That's not happening in downtown Seattle. But downtown Seattle, your internet searches may be monitored. Your, your telephone calls may be recorded. Um, and so the information that we're receiving there, and that's why I think Snowden is being perceived slightly different, is that is impacting us, us as Americans. But, you know, I, I think ultimately history will be the judge. And oftentimes people who do great things are not appreciated during their time. So, middle over here. I wondered what your thoughts were on um, just the, the, the sentence, you know, harsh sentence and the, and the harsh treatment is really doesn't even have to do as much with Chelsea Manning as it has to do with the people who might imitate her in the future. And, mm -hmm. you know, the fear that with too much openness it would be difficult for the U.S. to carry out foreign policy in the way that it does. You know, Right. You know, I think the open diplomacy, the idea of open diplomacy, uh, has been around for quite a while. Um, we don't practice it, and there's this idea that we can't. And the thing that I've really seen through this case is a mentality of, if you knew what I knew, you wouldn't question me. Um, well, you know what? I got to see what they knew. I got to see behind the Wizard of Oz curtain, and I was not impressed. Um, so I, I think if we knew what they knew, we would realize, in some instances, we need to get better people in the position. But in most instances, there's no reason for that to be secret. Uh, back here. Uh, you've had many uh, anti-war people who emerged from the military since 2003. Uh, Aaron Watata. People were very articulate, and they were inspiring. They educated us, and uh, we learned a lot. But we haven't heard very much directly from Chelsea Manning. Is, is she going to write a book at some point, or uh, tell us more about it? But obviously, she, it wasn't like an accident. It was a, really an act of courage and defiance. Yes. Right. She did it. You know, she said, "I'm going to take this stuff and go out here and I'm going to do this." You know, so that's that's really unusual. And so I'd like to I'd like to read her book if she does. Yeah, I, I would imagine at some point in the future there will be the story as told by Chelsea Manning. I would see that in the future. Um, you know, this brings up, I, I won't answer this very long, but somebody might have a question out there of like why certain things were done during the trial. And if there was anything that you didn't like and you're like, why did she do that? Like the apology, that, that caused some people to be upset. If there was something that was done you didn't like, chances are pretty good. Uh, it was my brainchild, so you can blame me. Uh, one of the things uh, that you have to know is obviously you're working within a system. You, it has rules, and if I could change them, I would, but when you can't, then you have to work within that system to influence the outcome that you want. And right now, Chelsea's still, even though her trial is over, she's still within the system. And there is a big date uh, on the horizon, and there are several opportunities for favorable outcomes for her. So my perspective as her attorney is always protecting her, always ensuring that what she's doing cannot be spun in a negative way. Uh, most recently when she uh, participated with Time Magazine to write what she was thankful for. Uh, Time approached me and said, would she be interested in doing this? And for me, I immediately, I have to confess, started to think all the ways that that could be misinterpreted. And ultimately, I came up with, how can you hold um, against a person when something, when they say, this is what I'm thankful for? So uh, the equation came with, this could be something that she could do, and it'd be okay. Um, but right now, I think Chelsea would be much more outspoken if she wasn't listening to me. So, <laughs> so blame me. Uh, get back over here. How did 
Yeah, so in Quantico, she was tortured. And Quantico, very public, um, uh, what her conditions were. I think also a byproduct of the thought process um, from the people in Quantico that the government at the very highest levels had approved of these conditions. And so they had nothing to fear. If you know your boss is on board with what you're doing, uh, you don't have to worry about any um, repercussions for your actions. Ultimately, the judge did the right thing and said this was unlawful pretrial punishment. But her remedy was not the right thing. 112 days of pretrial confinement credit. When you think about criminal sentences, oftentimes prosecutors say, let's send a message. Let's ensure that you know, the future whistleblowers you know, see this 35-year sentence and would think twice about releasing information. Well, that, if that argument works that way, well, then why not having it work the opposite way when somebody punishes somebody unlawfully prior to trial? What kind of message do you send when you give 112 days as credit? You, you essentially say you can punish them with impunity. So, up front here. Um, I'd like to write a letter to Chelsea Manning particularly on the occasion of Nelson Mandela's death. And uh, I was just, so my, my question is, how does one go about doing that? And, and, but I also want to make a point, because uh, in 1968, I was convicted of mutiny during the Vietnam days and went to USDB. And you know, the first people that were convicted in my little band of mutineers uh, got 16 years, and I was one of the ringleaders, and I was pretty sure I was going to spend a long time there. And before I was supposed to be out, just they, they clearly just made a political decision to let us out, and they let us all out. I mean, they, they came up with an excuse. It was, you know, commandant's parole or something. But they basically just let us out at a certain point. They said, go away. And I found myself standing on the street of Leavenworth, Kansas, with my stupid car code and $25 in my pocket, and, and I was free. And so I'm sure that, I mean, that happened to me. And so I know that that can happen to Bradley Manning, you know, and uh, I mean, not that we can raise false hopes, you know, that somehow somebody just can say, oh, I'm sick of it and let them go, but that happened to me. Yeah, and and I, I can't help but hold hope that if we can keep the pressure up, that uh, that, that could happen. And it, and it can. When we saw that as an example of her being moved from Quantico to the USDB, that was done when enough public pressure made it untenable for the government to continue with the status quo. If Chelsea received the Nobel Peace Prize, I think she'd be released. Um, so it, it is, it's gonna be something where the administration would have to be uncomfortable. Um, and, uh, you know, sadly, I would have to say, uh, not to show my political beliefs, but a pardon would have to be coming from a Republican as opposed to a Democrat, um, in my belief, just because of the way they're always being worried about public perception, appearing weak on certain issues. Democrats are usually very sensitive about appearing weak on certain things like military actions or terrorism or anything like that. Again, it's politics, but you would hope, you know, whoever they're looking at everything would just do the right thing instead of seeing what might be politically beneficial to them. Uh, the thing that would change that is public uh, outcry or the Nobel Peace Prize, which would be good. What about the part? You, you go to Courage to Resist um, or my webpage and there's all the information, how to write to, to Chelsea. Okay, so um, middle over here, anywhere? Middle, you're going to give up. All right, going towards the back row then, right there. Sir. Um, one of the theories of the torture early on was that they were trying to get him to uh, turn state's evidence against Julian Assange and mm -hmm. WikiLeaks. So I was wondering if, if you could speak to that, and did, did, did that come up in the trial at all? Yeah, so the government early on, again, th now this goes back to the idea of 
at the very highest levels, a mindset was made that we're going to kind of scorch the earth, take no prisoners. Um, and so here we got, uh, in the pretrial stage, I, I actually thought there would be a, a potential for a pretrial agreement. But the government never really came to the table as an honest broker for a pretrial agreement. They were always in the position of this is what you're going to take and you're going to like it. Um, to show you how unreasonable the government was, I can't go into the specifics of the number because we signed basically a non-disclosure agreement on it, but I can tell you that what they were offering was higher than what Chelsea received. So that gives you an idea of um, what they were essentially trying to give to Chelsea in order for her to avoid a life uh, without parole sentence. Um, also, I'll tell you then, that is what precipitated Chelsea's decision to plead guilty to lesser included offenses. Um, because if you are a judge, and everything I did was to educate the judge on this case. We, I would come up with motions um, just to raise issues for the judge, knowing I'm going to lose them. And I did lose my fair share of emotions, but j she had to hear the information though. And she's human and you know, no matter what you do, that registers in your mind. I was hoping it would register more than it did, but um, any event, the, the fact that Chelsea pled in the military aspect, uh, an accused never pleads guilty without the benefit of a deal. Just doesn't happen. The only time it does happen is if the government is being extremely unreasonable. And so that was my way and Chelsea's way of giving that message to the judge that, look, we're trying to accept responsibility. We don't have an honest partner on the other side of the table that's willing to meet us halfway on anything. So, middle here. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the role that the alternative media played in this trial, given how little attention that our yeah. existing media played and the role that Occupy Wall Street in particular, the media people they provided? It was huge. Um, I will tell you that mainstream media really largely ignored this case, which is amazing. Um, I think a lot of it was due to the fact that the military does not allow cameras in the courtroom. So that's, that's one thing that I'm actually trying to, to change and trying to influence. Uh, because if we had cameras in the courtroom, then you would have had Nancy Grace, you know, there, CNN, you know, every day and you would have had the American public seeing what was happening. Uh, but because you don't have cameras, then you have to actually do hard journalism. And, and yeah, and that takes too much effort. Um, so then you, you had to depend upon, which luckily we had, the Alexa O'Briens, the Kevin Gostolas, the Nathan Fullers, uh, the Glenn Greenwalds. You, you, you needed those type of people to step forward. Um, you also needed um, organizations like EFF that would put message out, put, put the uh, information out for others to know. So it was huge to have those organizations um, really backing Chelsea. And even though they were there, they weren't you know, blindly there. I mean, if there was something that was negative for Chelsea, they'd still report that. Uh, so it, they were just really doing what media should do, and that's report the story. Um, EFF, though, was huge in that they've crowdsourced and funded transcripts, daily transcripts, to where you can even go now to EFF and, I'm, I'm sorry, not EFF, it's kind of related to them, the Freedom of the Press Foundation. So the Freedom of the Press Foundation funded this, and you can go and you can actually read the transcripts. Um, which was an amazing thing. They got a um, person to transcribe the, each day's events uh, by the next day. Um, something you would hope the government could have done, but uh, they still haven't transcribed it to this date. Uh, so, all right, so towards the back, sir. No, you can. The, um, our, 
in the military, we have the Army Court of Criminal Appeals, then the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces. That's our highest court in the military. But then from the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces, there are routes and avenues to go to a federal uh, circuit court. Or if you want, there is a, a right of certiorari at least to apply to the Supreme Court. So, and there are occasional cases that go up to the Supreme Court. Um, I would probably say, on average, it, would, it might be one every three years or so, military cases that, if it's that often actually, that make it to the Supreme Court. But very few cases do make it to the Supreme Court. Okay, towards the back, yes. Right. Oh, so where she got the information she disclosed? Yes, the the Cipernet, think of the Cipernet like the internet uh, that you could log on to Google, except only you and uh, about a million of your closest friends have access to that internet, you know, and so that's what the Cipernet is. And so the Cipernet just housed all this information and there were ways to search it uh, much like you would use Google to search for, for web pages or whatnot. Um, and the, the military set that up um, really as a way of uh, being able to communicate and store information they don't want others to see. And then, of course, the rest of our government has kind of joined on that. So up front here, anyone? Yes. It's made it a lot more difficult to just use it. So they've, um, they, they took away thumb drives a while ago, and this was before Chelsea. Um, then they took away CDs. Uh, so now you, you can burn something down and save it from the Cipernet, but you need to have another like, person there. They log it and whatnot. So they just made everything a lot more difficult. Uh, and that's, that's really what's happened. The true answer to the problem isn't building higher fences, you know, well, isn't building fences wider to put all this information in. There was a, a quote, uh, I think it was, um, I'm going to butcher his name so I won't say it, but he, he essentially said our, what we should do in our government is build high fences around very little amounts of information instead of what we have now, low fences around a whole bunch of information. Um, and that's really the, what we should be doing. The, the Cipernet's way too big with uh, way too much information that really should be declassified. Um, recently, our government declassified the Pentagon Papers that have been out forever, you know? <laughs> I mean, that's just sad when that happens. But, okay, so I was middle here, so middle here, yes. Um, just another follow-up question to about the media. I'm wondering, as another mini barometer, as far as uh, alternative media, I'm curious to know: um, um, has the mainstream media reached out to you post-trial uh, for interviews as much as the alternative? They have, and you know, for me, much like with limiting Chelsea and what she does, that's for her advantage. Um, I'm doing that to myself, you know, so. Uh, talking to you, um, I'm happy to do that. The media, you, you really need to control who you speak to because oftentimes, unless it's live, then what message ultimately gets out there usually is not the message you wanted to put out. Um, and so I don't do anything unless it is live. Um, the Today Show actually, um, has been fantastic. They, they of course, did the Chelsea um, announcement, and then they've always said, if there's anything else important that you want to have uh, the stage in order to bring out, we'll put you on live, you just let us know when. Uh, so, you know, th there is mainstream, and then there's, of course, uh, other media that contact me all the time, but um, I, I don't, as you know, do too much. 
So I middle, middle, back. How is Chelsea doing? Does she know that we're in Seattle, for example, tonight? Did she get to hear about the impacts that is around the world from all the work that she's done? Yeah, Chelsea's doing very well. Um, she does know about uh, what's happening here tonight. She knows about this whole thing. Um, in addition to talking to me two or three times a week, uh, she talks to my wife frequently. Um, I spoke with my wife before I came here. Uh, she just got off the phone with Chelsea. Uh, they were talking. They're, they have a different type of relationship uh, than me and Chelsea. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'll digress just real quickly, share a personal story. So, you know, Chelsea released a, an article, you might have heard about it, or a, a little uh, statement to The Guardian. And that, that caused a, a little bit of pushback because of some misinterpretation of information in there. And I had to do a lot of things to kind of walk that back, if you will, to explain that's not really what Chelsea meant. And, and, and so that, that caused a lot of difficulty for me. And I wasn't happy, to say the least. And so Chelsea and I were, you know, I explained to her, look, you know, I'm your counsel. You need to, you need to at least run things by me. Ultimately, you can do what you want to do, but just run them by me. And Chelsea asked, well, is, is Tanya upset about this? And I said, well, yeah, she's upset about it. Well, I want to talk to Tanya about this. Okay. And Chelsea was more concerned about Tanya not being upset with her than she was with me. So it just kind of shows you where I, where I fall on the totem pole in the family, at least. Yeah. So up front here. Yes. Um, your view between military court and civilian court, um, why do you think, do you really think that military court should be separate from civilian court? So. Yeah, and that's something right now that Congress is is really doing a lot of debating on. Like, and it's mostly dealing with sexual assault, rape type offenses, thinking whether or not they should pull that out of the military system. I do think that the military should be separate from state and federal. Um, a lot of people, when they don't know something about one particular, like in this case, the military system, they may think, well, certainly the state or federal system would be better. Every system has its problems. A lot of times state systems, they don't do crimes because they're worried about conviction rates and re-election. Federal system, they don't go after crimes because they just view them as too small. Um, the military, the great thing about it, um, from the standpoint of, I guess, enforcing um, standards, is military judicial system is all about discipline, about enforcing um, good order and discipline in the military. The system, and I've done both state and federal and military, and in spite of this outcome, the military system has always, in my mind, been the far fairer system and better system. And I think the reason for that is, is it maybe a byproduct of the fact you have first-time offenders, and then you also have um, a very educated uh, system. Uh, everyone in the military has got a high school diploma. Uh, oftentimes they've got a bachelor's degree or a master's degree. If they're an officer, they've got a bachelor's at least, if not a master's. And so I think when you are exposed to more, you can't help but have a, a more open mind. It's not always the case, but uh, it tends to be a system that is more open-minded than you might think. Uh, the military integrated a lot longer, a lot quicker, and a lot uh, longer time ago than the rest of our society. Um, and I think the military is making steps now um, towards being much friendlier tor towards the LGBT community. Um, and hopefully one day we'll actually join other countries like Canada, uh, England, who allow any citizen to serve its country. But the, I think the military system is a good system and it needs to survive, but like every system, it can stand for a little tweaking. And the big tweak I think that would be helpful is to have cameras in the courtroom because then anyone who wants to see what happens and judge it with their own eyes could do so. And if there is something that's wrong, then we could fix it. 
So middle over. One one second. I'll come over here and then come right back to you. Middle over here. Anyone? Sir. Um, has uh, Chelsea confided in either you or your wife about what she like to do when she's out? When, when she what? When she's free. Oh. Yes, um, for me, and that hopefully I actually check this block for her before she gets out, um, although I wouldn't be disappointed if I don't. Uh, she wants to get her degree. She wants to go on to a post-bachelor degree. Um, her hope, I think, is um, she is somebody who has a lot of knowledge, both in computers, but engineering. Um, and I think her hope is to go into that field and perhaps if she's lucky find the right person married have a family so I think she wants what everyone else wants in life um, and I think for the first time in a long time she realizes that unlike early days in her life she's got people who care about her who who love her who want to see uh, her succeed and so I think with that comes a desire to have that in her life so hopefully she gets that chance soon. Sir. So the defense lawyers in the military court are all civilians? No. So in the military system, much like in the state or federal, you have a, essentially the equivalent of a public defender. In the military, it is a military person, usually a captain, and they're appointed free of charge to the service member. And if the service member wants, they can stick with that person. They don't have to hire civilian counsel. And then that person's free of charge to them. If they want to, then they can hire civilian counsel. And in cases that I'm hired, I'm always hired as a civilian counsel, even though I'm a reservist. And then the civilian counsel represents them. The, I, I think the constant criticism in the process is that military defense counsel are typically junior not always, but junior. And also, you only stay in that job for maybe three years and they put you in something else. And so there's this mentality of how hard are you gonna fight for me if, you, if I know three years from now, or two years from now, you're gonna be going out back to the government side. Do you really wanna burn any bridges? You know? And that's a fair criticism. Um, but I respond to that when soldiers actually call me to see if they wanna hire me, I tell them, look, judge your military defense counsel based upon their efforts and and ask them questions and if you feel comfortable with them you don't need to hire me um, and I then I tell them a little known story for them I say look I was a military defense counsel and I told clients all the time you can hire a civilian counsel but no one's gonna work harder for you than me and you don't have to pay me anything and sometimes they hired civilian counsel sometimes they didn't um, but if somebody is fortunate enough to get a military council like that, they don't need to pay money out of their own pocket. And our service members don't get paid enough. So, okay, so back. Go ahead. Jump up, yeah. Um, well, there's just a couple of things that were kind of running through my mind as you were talking was, you know, one, what kind of a society is it where you know, where people are just like being murdered, being tortured, you know what I mean? Like all these crimes that, you know, Chelsea Manning exposed, we don't have to live in a, in a society or in a country that does that. Right. And the other thing is that we could actually live in a world where people like, you know, I mean, one of the reasons, I mean, let me just back up, one of the reasons why we don't have to live in this kind of a world is because, I mean, this. This book, Basics by Bob Bagan, he talks about this. The essence of what exists in the U.S. is not democracy, but capitalism, imperialism, and political structures to enforce that capitalism and imperialism. I'm not going to go on long, but it's important. What the U.S. spreads around the world is not democracy, but imperialism and political structures to enforce that imperialism. That's why we don't have to live in that kind of world. We could have a revolution that gets rid of that system. And the That's other thing right. is that this is an evil system. And the, and the other thing is that you know, the third thing is we could actually live in a world where you know, where if you had a situation where there was people in the military who were doing things like who were you know, with the, someone saw something that was wrong and it was against the interests of humanity, that when that person stepped forward and they blew the whistle, they would be heroes. 
But the thing is, is that we need a, we need socialism and we need communism. That's where I'm coming from. And I know there's different people in the room today, but here's somebody who you know is hungering for revolution. And you know, and how are we going to end this? You know, and and at the same time, I think it's really really important when people you know that, that you step forward in the face of you went you know in a lot of ways you went up you're going up against you know this whole system and they are bringing they brought everything down. You know, on Chelsea, and what kind of a, of a world is this, where you know someone like? I mean, it, it's, it, it's. I think it's just an indictment of this system that you that this whole time that you've been fighting with your hands behind your back, and I think it's also an argument for why we shouldn't just limit to working within the framework of the system, including you know honestly in this particular battle. So I don't. Know, I don't know what you think about that, but you know, mainly what I wanted to ask is, what do you think about that quote about? What the U.S. spreads around the world is not democracy, but capitalism and imperialism. Yes. And the well, uh, I will say that the diplomatic cables show, obviously, us not always doing the right thing. And that, I think, is, well, I mean, and that, that comes as a surprise to some people that we always kind of, look to what's our best interest, what's in our interest, and that is problematic. There is a, a kind of a, a reason why that happens, I think, because we have, for, for the most part, um, for first world problems, and that's what we think are real problems. You know, uh, the first world problem is my internet is a little too slow. I mean, I'm, my speed needs to be a little quicker than what it is. Um, first word problem, I, you know, my, you know, I haven't got a good option to buy for an 8.1, Windows 8.1 laptop convertible. Yeah, and yeah, so these are the first world problems that people complain about when in other countries it's water, it's food, it's shelter. So I, I think that's the main problem. You, you're, it's hard to have a revolution when people are not really hungry and people are are too comfortable so our time is up i'm sorry to say but let's thank david coombs mm -hmm.